All right, in this video, we're going to take a look at the orchestration measure by measure from measure one to rehearsal. And let me make sure I've got this right to uh, rehearsal 12. So we're going to go through from measure one, uh, from page one to page 15. Let's go ahead and start here. Look at measure one. Measures one and two are just the euphoniums and tubas. And we've got this wedge motif. Da -dum. Bum, 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 bum. Bum, 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 bum. Ever expand the outward and outward. If you graph this out, the notes would essentially look like a triangle. We've got this piano crescendoing to forte. This becomes a pretty big motif in the piece. But we've just got the softer sounds of the euphoniums and tubas here. Measure three, we add in the bassoons and the sarusophone, followed on in beat three by the bass and contrabass clarinet. And finally, on our culmination note, this concert A flat, we add in the baritone and bass saxophones, as well as a timpani roll and down here at the very bottom a pizzicato note in the basses this is immediately followed by a decrescendo and interestingly you can see how he orchestrates the decrescendo notice the euphoniums cut out right here while the tubas keep going the woodwinds, all holding out that note, continue through. We then start adding in some of the middle voice woodwinds, starting with tenor sax, then second clarinet, then alto sax, then solo clarinet, then flutes and oboes in octaves. Interestingly, the the second clarinet or solo clarinets actually they're coming in with the alto saxophones and they're going to be in or alto saxophone just one this is an interesting texture here so you've got two solo b flat clarinets against the one alto sax in octave so this is going to sound um as an f5 and this is going to sound as an f4 but let's go on to page two. Page two has a lot more going on, as you see. And we can, we'll can continue on looking at that held note. The bassoons cut out on beat one. The sarusophone goes all the way to the next bar. And the bass and contrabass clarinets do exactly the same thing. And then here we have the berry saxes. That's hard to say, berry saxes, because you are so used to not having more than one of them. They hold on for just a little bit over two more measures. So they cut off last, though the tenor sax has come in, and it's holding out an A-flat, an octave up. And then finally, the longest held is our, tuba, our timpani. Down here in the sax horns you have a cue saying in case you don't have a sarusophone the t the tuba should play this note this is why they're not really ad lib parts they're cued but they should be there so let's look at um what's going on melody wise we've got uh one melody going on between uh, the solo clarinets and first alto saxophone that started before in the previous measure. So this is what was going on interesting. They're introducing a melody and not a texture. This is offset one bar by the flutes and oboes in octaves. So we got clarinet and alto sax in octaves. And then in canon with that a measure later is flutes and oboes in octaves. And then we die out, and this is uh, three bars after one. And we have a solo baritone. This is one of those 
voices that will get lost in the transcriptions. One of the very first true solos we get is a solo baritone horn. And that's just an instrument that modern wind bands do not use. However, it's really integral to this opening texture. Whoops, went too far. So here in the fourth bar after one, we have this very dramatic uh, quintuplet with the first uh, note left off. Ba -ba 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 this is in all the low reeds. So bassoons, sarusophone, bass clarinet, contrabass clarinet, barium bass sax. And it's cued down here in the euphoniums. So this is just going to be in the low reeds. And this gesture, again, is going to be an important little motif that will come back throughout the piece. And then we've got our solo clarinets again with the first alto sax playing this melody offset now one beat by the flutes and oboes in octaves. And let's just check pitches here. So the solo clarinet, that's going to be a sounding G flat against... <gasps> A tritone. So we've got what was in pure octaves here. Are we, were these in octaves? Let's double check just to make sure. That's a F against a B. Oh, no, we're in tritones here. So we've got canon in the tritone. Lovely. That's some great counterpoint writing from Schmidt there. So we got here we're off here in the first bar of one and the second bar we're offset a full measure but we've compressed that now by the fifth and sixth bars of one we're now a beat offset in our uh, counterpoint and then we've also got this little counter melody here in the tenor saxophones De -da -da. And our baritone horn comes back a little bit and helps out with some of that tenor saxophone type line. We've got some interesting counterpoint going on here in the second clarinet. So let's go on to page three. All right, we've got a bunch of tempo markings. Uh, we're just getting faster and faster. A chill with movement, a chill, and then slight retard here. So we've got this the wedge motive coming back here in the low reeds. So bassoon, sarusophone, bass and contra clarinet, tenor, berry, and bass saxes. So we've added the tenor now into the low reeds where it had been helping out before and then cued down here in the phonium. However, the baritone keeps going with its melody. We've got the octave melody returning here in the flutes and oboes. And it's counterpointed now. This is the lead here. And it's now a perfect fifth apart from the clarinet and alto sax. So we got tritone, tritone. Now we've expanded it out to a perfect fifth here at rehearsal two. Let's go down here and look at the sax horns in the three, four, the two measures of three, four. We've got this building up from piano to forte all in well, not quite all in triplets. It's da 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 against absolutely nothing else. Again, when we do a transcription of this and change this out of of using a full section of sax horns, this sound right here is gone. This warm-bodied 
cohesive sound. Particularly if you put this in trumpets and horns, this will sound so totally different. And then as we build up to this forte right here, the 4-4, four, four, the sax horns then just go down and decrescendo. So we haven't built up to a climax, we've just hinted at a climax. And then we've got our wedge motif down here in the tubas and double bass, as well as all the low reed instruments. And we've added in now the alto saxophones as quote unquote low reeds. We also get our first taste of one of the so-called orchestral brass, the trumpets, cornets, horns, and trombones in a solo horn here. And let's go on to page four and see what that solo horn is doing. It's uh, a lovely chromatic line. Dee, da, 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 dee, da, 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 so that is one of the, the key mov movements here, but where our focus really should go is to the two solo clarinets here on page four. So solo clarinet one, hands off to solo clarinet two, and then they play together and then back to just one, and then they play together again. So it should sound like a single player playing this Underneath that, we've got, interestingly, Devisi bass clarinets and tenor sax, uh, I'm sorry, baritone saxophones. So we've got uh, this is going to produce a real reedy sound here, particularly they're going to be in sixth down here. And do we have anything accompanying that down here in the sax horns? And the answer is no. So the baritone saxophones and the bass clarinets are really providing our foundation here. And this lovely little triplet here, notice how it's coming when the solo clarinets really aren't doing any, uh, they're just holding out. So this is gonna bring your focus here. But it um that kind of but it um is a real key element of this piece. As the solo clarinets grow, we start adding in flute two, followed by two oboes in unison. And then let's look down here at this last measure uh, and see what the sax horns are doing. And we've got this sax horn build again, building from the tubas euphoniums and then just slowly adding in the rest of them. Notice that the Sopranino sax horn has not played yet. And then here at rehearsal four, on uh, top of page five, we uh, move to a solo flute. This is why the previous measure was in second flute to give first flute a chance to prepare for their four bar solo here. Underneath that, we have solo English horn and solo bassoon, which leads us to go back to the last video where Schmidt said these are optional they're not optional. If we've got solos here and solo here, they're not optional. Interestingly, the solo flute is also doubled two octaves lower by the alto saxophone. This is a really unusual pairing. So we got solo flute up in its really high uh, soloistic range and then alto sax right in its middle range and accompany that with two tenor saxes, two berry saxes, and eventually we add in the bass sax. We'll talk about the fourth measure of this page here in just a second. We've got triangle, just adding in a couple tings in there. And then nothing going on here in the, the sax horns except cues. 
Here in this fourth measure, we start really building up though. Pizzicato here in the string bass, and then the heavily divided uh, flugel horns, alto horn, and baritone horns with our um, single reeds here, the E flat clarinet, solo clarinet, bass clarinet. So essentially what would be the orchestral clarinet section having this flourish up with the band section, the, the first and second clarinets giving the ictus right here on downbeat of four. And then our saxophones give us this lovely sweep up all underneath this timpani roll. And the timpani roll here is acting as a glue holding that whole section together. So let's go to measure five. And here, all the clarinets are now in unison. The E flat, an octave higher than all the, uh, what would amount to be, what is that? 26 B flat clarinets. Right at the top of that run, the flutes, piccolos and oboe get added in and are any of the uh sax horns added in the the sopranino flugelhorn is added in just a little bit here to just kind of emphasize the top bit of that and it's not going to do the the fiddly bits there as soon as it gets to the second bar, the alto saxes add in. They wouldn't be able to actually play within the appropriate register the, the notes here. It would have to be down an octave, and Schmidt doesn't want that. Had he used a soprano saxophone in the scoring, there would be a continuous saxophone sound throughout the first measure of five. But because we don't have that, and altissimo was really not a thing, or a, a thing commonly done by saxophone players at this time, then we don't really, we're not really going to see it. In fact, we actually know who the saxophone player was who would have been performing this part, and it's actually Marcel Moulin. Um who is the great patron of the French saxophone school throughout the 20th century, he started out in the Guard Republican Band, and he essentially refused to ever play altissimo, regarding it as simply a gimmick. And we've got this unison line in the upper winds continuing throughout the page, slowly dying off. We leave off, take off the piccolos first, then the oboes, then the flutes go down, and they actually, the flutes, interestingly enough, go with the bassoons here. This is a actually a pretty common scoring technique where we take bassoons and flutes and put them together. So first bassoon, first flute are together here. Second bassoon is providing some harmony to that. We continue to diminuendo here. We do not take out any of the clarinets, but it does pass on, interestingly enough, here to the tenor saxophone. And down here, we've got passing uh, back and forth between the first flugelhorns and the second flugelhorns. Are the flugelhorns on a secondary line? Let's see. I think the flugelhorns here are actually playing with the bassoons. So flugelhorn and bassoon, that's going to be a really, really nice tone color. And again, the timpani is here serving to provide a foundation for the whole ensemble. Okay, we're going to measure uh, page seven now, up to rehearsal six. And here we do have just a lot of unison playing. So we've got this line here in the upper woodwind that's taken mostly by the clarinet. The flutes, when they get up high, take over there. We've got, again, a low line here in the low reeds in the bassoon, sarusophone, bass and contra clarinets, and the low saxes. So essentially within the woodwinds, we only have two lines. The upper line, which is the high, uh, flutes, oboes, uh, 
clarinets and upper saxes, and then the low line, which is the bassoons, uh, low clarinets and low saxes. And finally, we get all of the orchestral brass coming in, trumpets, cornets, horns, and trombones, playing da, 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 da. And the sax horns down here are helping out with that, except for the Sopranino flugelhorn, which is playing the upper woodwind line. So we've got this real flourish up here into the upper range of the Sopranino flugelhorn. So something to notice here is how little the orchestral brass has been used. In fact, these are the first real notes for the trumpets and the trombones, and we are at rehearsal six. So they've really just stayed back and let everybody else in the ensemble do their job. And these guys just come in to punch up. Here in the fourth trombone, the bass trombone part, we've got these B natural uh, and C natural, it's these really low notes that in 1914 would have been really pushing the limit of what the bass trombone could do. This is why I have some suspicions that it may have been an E flat bass trombone or even a valve contrabass trombone. I just, I don't have enough information from the time of what instrument was used, but this these notes would be very uh, out of the ordinary for French scoring in the 1910s. So let's go on to page eight. We've got a lot going on here. So some things that to point out. We've got unison bassoons, bass clarinet, and baritone sax in this line here. The upward chromatic line. And is anybody else joining bassoons, bass clarinet, and baritone sax? Let's just see. Let's look down here. No. So it's just going to be those low reeds. Interestingly, let's look here at the first and second clarinets. In the first clarinets, we have a four-way divisi. This is one of the reasons he asks for 12 players. This would be three players per note. The B flat, E, D flat, and G flat. And against that, we've got a four-way divisi in the second clarinets. G flat, B flat, E, and D flat. So all told, between first and second clarinets, we have an eight-way divisi. He will do this quite frequently throughout the piece, and 12 is one of those numbers that's really easily divisible. You can divide it by 2, by 3, by 4, and by 6. We've got this punch note here in the flutes, oboes, E flat clarinets, and solo clarinets, as well as in the alto and tenor saxophones. And is that punched up by anything else? Well, yes, indeed. It is punched up by the triangle and our upper flugelhorns, including the sopranino flugelhorn. So that's going to really stick out. Look here, we've got a solo for the timpani. Very unusual. Da 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 da. Da, da, da. This whole thing in the second, uh, the, the last two bars of the page is essentially one line. It's a scale going up and then it, so it's a scale going up in 16th notes and then coming down in sextuplets. Right here, we've got upper G natural in the E-flat clarinet. This is really pushing the range of where the E-flat clarinet is going to be comfortable. You might be able to go a tone higher, but not too much more. This marking here is actually somewhat unusual to see in a printed score, particularly my Durand. And it's just a, a coal marking, C-O-L, and it says play exactly what the first clarinets are playing. We've got another punch note here on beat three of the fourth bar of the page. 
And that's punched up by the trumpets and the cornet. Uh, first cornet only. And it's that punched up here. Not, well, kind of. We've got it in the symbols, uh, suspended symbol. Says with uh, timpani sticks, although today, of course, that'd be just regular old yarn mallets. And we have one trill here in the upper E flat uh, sopranino flugelhorn. It's the only instrument in the whole ensemble trilling. And leaving out that instrument, uh, you would leave out the trill if you transcribe this to a more modern wind band. So that would be a sound you would completely lose. And that would be quite difficult um, on a... Uh, you would probably play that on a trumpet, or even a piccolo trumpet. And that would be... Uh, so that's a G to A trill written sounding uh, B flat to C. So on a, on a B flat trumpet, it would be a high C trill. On a piccolo trumpet, it would be a C in the staff trill, which would be a little bit easier. But you'd lose that warm sound of the flugelhorn. Rehearsal seven. So we've got our low voices again, having this melody here. And low voices, really, I should say, these are almost more middle voices because we've got them really in a middle or upper register. Bassoons and octaves, bass clarinets um, in unison here, all the upper saxes without the bass sax. And actually, the horns are playing the same thing, just without the triplet infusion here. Against this, we have the dance rhythm. And most of the dance rhythm is in the upper sax horns, the flugelhorns, alto horn, and baritone. Da 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 da. Followed by a response in the solo timpani. And then the last two notes of the solo timpani are emphasized by the phonemes and tubas. To that, we add a punch note here in the flutes, oboes, and all the upper clarinets. And the upper clarinets are Divisi, so we've got uh, first and second clarinets are Divisi um, A2. And then, of course, we have our first and second E flats, first and second solos. And then the B flat uh, solo clarinets join in on the first clarinet part here. We then have our descending line and every available woodwind instrument that can play that descending line joins in under a tremolo in the timpani. And we go here to page 10. And we've calmed down a little bit. Now we've got the last remnant of that dance rhythm. Da, 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 da in the trombones looks like it's just trombones one two and three and no bass trombone with the snare drum and bass drum now comes in and the sax horns just hold out a note and then they've got cues but the important thing here on this page is we have a bass clarinet duet very unusual and it is possible that Schmidt took some uh, influence here from Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, where he has bass clarinet duets. In performance, it won't sound so much like a duet because it's handing off back and forth. And so on. So it's going back and forth between first and second bass clarinets. That is cued in some of the other instruments. So you can see a cue here in baritone sax or in tenor sax, as well as down in the euphonium part. Underneath that, we come back to what we had at the beginning, the wedge motif. In the bassoon saxophone and the bass saxophone. The bass saxophone will be really prominent here. This is one of those, if you don't have a bass saxophone, just don't play the piece. This is one of those really great 
bass saxophone moments. And then we add in the baritone saxophone when we go up a tritone and it gets into the baritone saxophone's range. These are cued into the contrabass tuba part, but the sound of the tuba there will not give us the real reedy pointed articulation that we need here at rehearsal eight. Let's go on to the next page and that is page 11. And we continue our bass clarinet solo for another three bars. We've got this lovely trio between two flutes and first oboe. And these appear to be mostly in sixth and then first flute and first oboe are here in octaves. Think of it as the first flute here is reinforcing an upper harmonic of first oboe. With the bass clarinet solo continuing into the third bar of the page, it's picked up by the solo B flat clarinets and they continue on the melody upwards way up into the top register up to this high written F sounding E flat six. And it continues actually upwards with this flourish in the flutes and piccolo. Here we have an accompaniment in the trumpets uh, and adding in the cornets a couple bars later with straight mutes. Uh, straight mutes at the time were the only mute really available. So anytime you see sordines or sword, it's just regular old straight mute. This is a new color that we have not heard yet in the piece. And interestingly, with the trumpets entering, he also brings in a tam-tam hit to give this a real moment of gravitas. And then the sax horns are not doing anything, but let's look at this last measure of the page. And we've got muted alto horns and baritone horns in piano, and then this fantastic uh, celeste flourish between the two hands. And this just is one of those brief moments of color that make this piece just sparkle with magic. And that's going along with the upper solo B flat clarinets. We've got the four-way de VC in both first and second clarinet parts here as well. And then a solo English horn coming in here in beat three. And the English horn is the only instrument that seems to come in in beat three. It actually, it looks like it, what it's doing is helping out the uh, trumpets and cornets. So just providing really the lower note for those instruments. All right, let's go to page 12 now. On page 12, we continue and we've got flute melody here. This is going to be really where our focus should be for at least two bars. And that's accompanying an octave lower by the English horn. And then, actually it's two, two octaves lower by the English horn and then two octaves lower by the first bassoon. We get our bass clarinet and berry sax. This is material that we have seen before. So this has come back. We saw this earlier. Some cue notes here in the trumpets. We're going to ignore those. Triangle hit, bass drum hit. And then really important here is a solo flugelhorn. The flugelhorn is really what's going to take our interest here. And then right on the third bar of this, we've got a grand pause. In fact, this should really be take a lot of time. You'll notice the, the square fermata here. So big pause. And then we've got the ba -da 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 -da. and then another square fermata here. So a second grand pause after a very brief five note bass clarinet solo. And then it's suddenly fast. 
I mean, we just changed the tempo directly. And we're now approaching our new section. And the, we've got this flourish here, starting in the bassoons, the second clarinets going up to the upper flutes, piccolo, E flat, and solo clarinets and the trill. We've got the offbeats. This becomes really, really important later. And then look at this here in the trumpets and the cornets. This just rapid fire double tonguing. These 30 second notes at 100. That's accompanied by. Uh, what it amounts to a roll on the suspended symbol. It, I, it's written with. Uh, it says baguette de temp uh, timbale, which is timpani sticks. But you're not going to get any semblance to that exact rhythm. So this might be a case where the player on the suspended symbol will go to a harder stick just to get a little bit of that closer to precise rhythm. Even maybe a snare drum stick. The flugelhorns add in on the last upbeat rhythm. And then let's go on to page 13. And this is now starting to get really into the bulk of the, the piece here at rehearsal 10. We've got these uh, bra, bra, bra. So between the clarinets are on the tays, the flutes and oboes are on the downbeats. So this is our, our big dance rhythm. And then look here in the bassoon. So the bassoons have this whole melody here, starting in measure two, three, and four on the page. And that same thing is broken up between the tenor saxophones and the alto saxophones. And then the sarusophone, bass clarinet, contrabass clarinet, and berry and bass saxophones. Bra, 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 bra. And we have our xylophone coming in for the first time. So this is going to be a new timbre. Take a look at the notation here. It appears that the xylophone is not written as a transposing instrument. Typically, xylophone parts are one octave higher than written. However, if that's the case, what is that first note? That's so many ledger lines to read. Is that an E? So C, E, G, B. Uh, it may be that it's written at correctly, but... He, what he's also done is written in the sticking. So it's right, left, right, left, right, left, right. So up stems are right hand, left stems are left hand, or down stems are left hand. Confusing. This is not a practice that composers need to worry about doing. The player is going to know how to stick the xylophone part. So it's not going to be an issue here. Here is something really interesting here. Take a look in the third bar in the baritone part. We've got this massive glissando here from beat two to beat three. Is anybody else doing it? Well, the tenor saxophone has, it is a sextuplet as do the bassoons, but it's written as a glissando in the baritones. My guess is the conductor of this piece will ask the baritones to emulate the saxophone of the bassoon. Here is where, take a look at the euphonium part here. Remember, it's marked as bass. One, two, three, four. We've got our six euphoniums divided four ways. It's not an even divide. Stems up are one and three. Stems down are two and four. This is quite confusing notation, to be perfectly honest. And so you're trading back and forth between 
one, two, one, two, one, both. This would be, for an engraving point of view, this would be a section where you'd really want to do this on two staffs, but it's already a really crowded page, so adding another staff would um, make it a little harder to read. Well, let's go on to the next page, and that is page 14, and this is going to be the last page we cover in this video. Nope, we have one more page, sorry. All right, so we take a look here at the clarinets. This is all these seconds between the E flats. This is just gonna be one of those really crunchy sounds in the shallow range for all of them. And we've got, so F, let's just take a look at beat three here and see what notes we have. F sharp, C, D, C, D, and so let's look at these in concert pitch. E, B flat, C, and then we have B flat, C. So it's actually just a C7 chord. That's actually pretty normal. The baritone saxophone here, interestingly, is uh, with the bassoons. And we've got Devisi between first and second bassoon here. First and second baritone sax here. By the last measure, we go down to just the bassoons in the woodwind. And let's take a look down here at what the sax horns are doing. We've got, again, another glissando here in the baritone horns. Let's see, that mirrors, yep, that mirrors exactly what's going on in the baritone sax and the bassoon. Lone xylophone note here, it'll really stick out. That's coloring the trumpet and cornet hit note, and as well as something in the oboes and English horn. Within the rest of the sax horns here, we have basically boom, chuck, boom, chuck, boom, chuck, boom, 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 and the double bass down here is just highlighting. Dot, 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 dot. This is all. This is the wedge motive. Backwards this time, though. And then the last measure, we're just down to our two bassoons and sarusophone with a snare drum roll, as well as accompanied by three alto horns. This is a sound you can't get in any other kind of ensemble. Bassoons. And alto horns. That's so, so cool. And then this page is a lot of black. In order to think about this page, essentially you have scalar motions going up and down. You're leading into this 3-4 that's going to be where we stop for today. That starts a new section. Everything up until this point has been a long introduction. So let's take a look. Easiest to look at are the saxophones. So we have, everybody has a grand pause on beat one of 11. The snare drum keeps going as well as the alto horns. They are the only ones holding on and playing beat one. The saxophones take our sextuplet uh, run here. Ba, ba, ba. This is a really important rhythm here. And then we've got just this scalar motion starting in altos, handing off to the tenor, handing off to the baritone, handing off to the bass. Once they've been handed off, the upper voices are now free to do this 12 let upwards and this is just you'll you won't even hear the individual note that's going by so fast notice in this first bar everybody that has the sextuplets they are all tongued we have this 
passage here, the flute and piccolo are actually in unison, even though it looks like they're written an octave apart. And that becomes apparent when we look here at this last bar. The flutes go up until they can't go up anymore. Then the piccolos continue on and the flutes drop an octave lower and pick up. Adding in the percussion now, sur le bois, means on the rim. So the snare drum player is going to go to the rim. We are adding in triangle, bass drum roll, our xylophone comes back. And the sax horns are now doing a lot of the same stuff that the upper woodwinds are. So look at this in the, the sax horn part. Uh, the 12 tuplet in the Sopranino flugelhorn and the 6 tuplet and the regular flugelhorn and this in the double bass down here which is just uh, a major scale or uh, it's a mode of something I'd have to look at it to see exactly what it is but it's just this is a wild page and that all leads us into rehearsal 12 on page 16 which we'll get to in the next video so hope you found this interesting and we'll continue on starting on page 16 of Dionysiacs in the next video